Welcome to 2024 and the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter. Welcome to lesson number five, titled Singing the Lord's Song in a Strange Land. It's ready for teaching on Sabbath February 3 and is from the Sabbath School lesson series Psalms, authored by Dr. Dragoslava Sandrak and read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, January 27. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that these songs we've been reading about in the book of Psalms, the songs that sing praise to you, but also show the heart of the writers and the heart of your people as they worshipped you just so long ago. And as we continue our study into these beautiful words and these beautiful thoughts and the beautiful messages that come from them, We pray that your Holy Spirit will be with us as we open your word this week. And today I'd particularly like to pray for people around the world who are listening. Some are visually impaired, uh, some have difficulty reading, but most just want to know what your word has to say today. And in this Sabbath School lesson, I'd like to pray for Hazel and Balliston, for Samsung Blue in Guyana in South Africa, South America, for Charlene Paris and her family, and she's from Eustatius in the Dutch Caribbean, and Virginia Casanova and friends Travis and Anthony, who've asked for prayer for special needs at this time. Lord, wherever we are, we pray that we may put our trust in you and know that you are always faithful. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Psalm 137 and verse 4. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Let's read that again. Psalm 137 verse 4. How shall we sing the Lord's song in in a strange land. We do not need to get deep into the book of Psalms in order to discover that the Psalms are uttered in an imperfect world, one of sin, evil, suffering and death. The stable creation run by the sovereign Lord and his righteous laws is constantly threatened by evil. As sin corrupts the world more and more, the earth has increasingly become a strange land to God's people. This reality creates a problem to the psalmist. How does one live a life of faith in a strange land? As we already have seen, the psalmists acknowledge God's sovereign rule and power as well as his righteous judgments. They know that God is the everlasting and never failing refuge and help in time of trouble. For this reason, the psalmists are at times perplexed, who isn't, by the apparent absence of God and the flourishing of evil in the face of the good and sovereign Lord. The paradoxical nature of the psalms as prayers is demonstrated in the psalmist's responses to God's seeming silence. In other words, the psalmist's response to God's perceived absence as well as to God's presence. Sunday, January 28, The Days of Evil. Read Psalm 74, 18 to 22, and 79, 5 to 13. What is at stake here? First of all, Psalm 74, beginning at verse 18. Remember this, that the enemy has reproached, O Lord, and that a foolish people has blasphemed your name. O do not deliver the life of your turtle dove to the wild beast. Do not forget the life of your poor forever. Have respect to the covenant, for the dark places of the earth are full of the haunts of cruelty. O do not let the oppressed return ashamed. Let the poor and needy praise your name. Arise, O God, plead your own cause. Remember how the foolish man reproaches you daily. And Psalm 79, 5 to 13. How long, Lord, will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? 
Pour out your wrath on the nations that do not know you, and on the kingdoms that do not call on your name, for they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his dwelling place. Oh, do not remember former iniquities against us. Let your tender mercies come speedily to meet us, for we have been brought very low. Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name, and deliver us and provide atonement for our sins for your name's sake. Why should the nation say, Where is their God? Let there be known among the nations in our sight the avenging of the blood of your servants which has been shed. Let the groaning of the prisoner come before you according to the greatness of your power. Preserve those who are appointed to die and return to our neighbours sevenfold into their bosom their reproach with which they have reproached you, O Lord. So we, your people and sheep of your pasture, will give you thanks forever. We will show forth your praise to all generations. What is at stake here? The psalmist seeks to grasp the great controversy between God and the powers of evil, and he points to God's unfathomable forbearance, as well as to his infinite wisdom and power. The problem of evil in the Psalms is primarily theological. It inevitably concerns questions about God. Thus, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple is seen principally as a divine scandal because it provided an opportunity for the heathen to blaspheme God. God's inheritance, the people of Israel, is the sign of his divine election and covenant that will never fail, as we read in Deuteronomy 4, 32-38. For ask now concerning the days that are past which were before you, since the day that God created man on the earth, and ask from one end of heaven to the other, and whether any great thing like this has happened, or anything like it has been heard, did any people ever hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire, as you have heard and live? Or did God ever try to go and take for himself a nation from the midst of another nation, by trials? by signs, by wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and by great terrors according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes. To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord himself is God. There is none other besides him. Out of heaven he let you hear his voice, that he might instruct you. On earth he showed you his great fire, and you heard his words out of the midst of the fire. And because he loved your fathers, therefore he chose their descendants after them. And he brought you out of Egypt with his presence, with his mighty power, driving out from before you nations greater and mightier than you, to bring you in, to give you their land as an inheritance as it is this day. And also Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 and 9. When the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. The concept of God's inheritance also contains an end-time dimension, as one day all nations will become God's inheritance and will serve him. The notion that the nations invaded God's inheritance threatens these divine promises. No question, the psalmist acknowledges that the sins of the people corrupted the people's covenantal relationship with God and brought upon the people all the consequences, as you read in Psalm 79, verses 8 and 9. Oh, do not remember former iniquities against us. Let your tender mercies come speedily to meet us, for we have been brought very low. Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name, and deliver us, and provide atonement for our sins, for your name's sake. The people's survival depends solely upon God's gracious intervention and the restoration of the covenantal bond through the atonement of sin. 
the Lord is God of our salvation, which conveys God's faithfulness to his covenantal promises. We read in Psalm 79 verse 9. Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name, and deliver us and provide atonement for our sins for your name's sake. However more important than the restoration of Israel's fortunes is the defence of God's character in the world, as we just read in Psalm 79 verse 9. If the evil actions of the nations go unpunished, it will appear that God has lost his power. As we read in Psalm 74, 18 to 23, remember this, that the enemy has reproached, O Lord, and that a foolish people has blasphemed your name. O do not deliver the life of your turtle dove to the wild beast. Do not forget the life of your poor forever. Have respect to the covenant, for the dark places of the earth are full of the haunts of cruelty. Oh, do not let the oppressed return ashamed. Let the poor and needy praise your name. Arise, O God, plead your own cause. Remember how the foolish man reproaches you daily. Do not forget the voice of your enemies. The tumult of those who rise up against you increases continually. And Psalm 83, verses 16 to 18, fill their faces with shame, that they may seek your name, O Lord, let them be confounded and dismayed forever. Yes, let them be put to shame and perish, that they may know that you, whose name alone is the Lord, are the most high over all all the earth. And Psalm 106 verse 47, Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the Gentiles to give thanks to your holy name, to triumph in your praise. Only when God saves his people will his name be justified and uplifted. As today, the same principle existed back then. Our sins, our backsliding, our evils can bring disrepute, not only on ourselves, but worse, on the God whose name we profess. Our wrong actions can have detrimental spiritual effects on our witness and mission as well. How many people have been turned off to our faith by the actions of those professing the name of Christ? And so to finish today, from The Desire of Ages, page 671, we read, The honour of God, the honour of Christ, is involved in the perfection of the character of his people. End of quote. How do you understand this important truth and what it should mean to your own Christian life? Monday, June 29, at death's door. Read Psalm 41, verses 1 to 4, 88, 3 to 12, 102, verses 3 to 5, 11, 23 and 24. What experiences do these texts describe? In what can you relate to what is said here? First of all, Psalm 41, verses 1 to 4. Blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he will be blessed on the earth. You will not deliver him to the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him on his bed of illness. You will sustain him on his sickbed. I said, Lord, be merciful to me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. And Psalm 88, beginning at verse 3, For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to the grave. I am counted with those who go down to the pit. I am like a man who has no strength, adrift among the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, and who are cut off from your hand. You have laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the depths. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you have afflicted me with all your waves, Selah. You have put away my acquaintances far from me. You have made me an abomination to them. I am shut up and cannot get out. My eye wastes away because of affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon you. I have stretched out my hands to you. Will you work wonders for the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise you? Salah. 
Shall your loving kindness be declared in the grave, or your faithfulness in the place of destruction? Shall your wonders be known in the dark, and your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? And Psalm 102, verses 3 to 5, For my days are consumed like smoke, and my bones are burned like a hearth. My heart is stricken and withered like grass, so that I forget to eat my bread. Because of the sound of my groaning, my bones cling to my skin. And verse 11, My days are like a shadow that lengthens, and I wither away like grass. And verses 23 and 24, He weakened my strength in the way. He shortened my days. I said, O my God, do not take me away in the midst of my days. Your years are throughout all generations. These prayers for salvation from illness and death demonstrate that God's children are not exempt from the sufferings of this world. The Psalms reveal the psalmist's terrible afflictions. He is without strength, withering like grass, unable to eat, set apart with the dead, lying like the slain in the grave, repulsive to his friends, suffering and in despair. His bones cling to his skin. Many Psalms assume the Lord has permitted the trouble because of Israel's disobedience. The psalmist recognises that sin can bring sickness. Therefore, he refers to the forgiveness that comes before healing in Psalm 41, verses 3 and 4. However, some psalms, such as Psalms 88 and Psalm 102, acknowledge that the innocent suffering of God's people is a fact of life, no matter how hard to understand. In Psalm 88, God is charged with bringing the psalmist to the verge of death in verses 6 to 8. Notice, however, that even when the most daring complaints are uttered, the lament is clearly an act of faith for... If the Lord, in his sovereignty, allowed trouble, he could restore the well-being of his child. Let's read that text, uh, Psalm 88, verses 6 to 8. You have laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness in the depths. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you have, have afflicted me with all your waves, Selah. You have put away my acquaintances far from me. You have made me an abomination to them. I am shut up and cannot get out. At the grave's threshold, the psalmist remembers God's wonders, loving kindness, faithfulness and righteousness in verses 10 to 12. You will work wonders for the dead. Shall the dead arise and praise you? Salah. Shall your loving kindness be declared in the grave or your faithfulness in the place of destruction? Shall your wonders be known in the dark and your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? Despite his sense of being stricken by God, the psalmist clings to God. Although he suffers, he does not deny God's love and knows that God is his only salvation. These appeals show that the psalmist knows not only suffering, but also has an intimate knowledge of God's grace and that the two do not necessarily exclude each other. In short, both God's permitting of suffering and his deliverance are demonstrations of his ultimate sovereignty. Knowing that God is in control inspires hope. When we read Psalm 88 in the light of Christ's suffering, we are awed by the depths of his love in which he was willing to pass through death's door for the sake of humanity. And so to finish today, think about Jesus on the cross and what he suffered because of sin. How should that reality, that God in Christ suffered even worse than any of us, help us keep faith even amid times of suffering and trial? Tuesday, January 30, Where is God? Read Psalm 42, 1 to 3, Psalm 63, verse 1, Psalm 69, 1 to 3, and Psalm 102, verses 1 to 7. What causes great pain to the psalmist? 
Psalm 42, beginning at verse 1. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they continually say to me, Where is your God? And Psalm 63, verse 1, O God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. And Psalm 69, beginning at verse 1, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I have come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary with my crying. My throat is dry. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. And Psalm 102, beginning at verse 1. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my trouble. Incline your ear to me in the day that I call. Answer me speedily. For my days are consumed like smoke, and my bones are burned like a hearth. My heart is stricken and withered like grass, so that I forget to eat my bread. Because of the sound of my groaning, my bones cling to my skin. I am like a pelican of the wilderness. I am like an owl of the desert. I lie awake and am like a sparrow alone on the housetop. Not only does personal and communal sufferings trouble the psalmist, but also, if not more, God's seeming lack of attention to his servants' hardships. God's absence is felt like intense thirst in a dry land, we read in verses 1 to 3 of Psalm 42 and verse 1 of Psalm 63, and mortal anguish we read about in Psalm 102. The psalmist feels removed from God and compares himself to lonely birds. I am like a pelican of the wilderness. I am like an owl of the desert. I lie awake and am like a sparrow alone on the housetop in Psalm 102, verses 6 and 7. The mention of wilderness highlights the sense of isolation from God. A bird alone on a housetop is outside of its nest, its resting place. The psalmist cries to God out of the depths, as if being engulfed by mighty waters and sinking into a deep mire in Psalm 69 verses 1 to 3. And then in Psalm 130 verse 1, Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. These images depict an oppressive situation from which there is no escape except by divine intervention. Read Psalm 10, 12, Psalm 22, 1, Psalm 27, 9 and Psalm 39, 12. How does the psalmist respond to God's apparent absence? Psalm 10, verse 12, Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand, do not forget the humble. And Psalm 22, verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? And Psalm 27, verse 9, Do not hide your face from me, do not turn your servant away in anger, You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. And Psalm 39, verse 12. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Do not be silent at my tears, for I am a stranger with you, a sojourner as all my fathers were. It is remarkable that the psalmist resolved not to keep silence in the face of God's silence. The psalmist unswervingly believe in prayer because prayer is directed to the living and gracious God. God is still there even when he is apparently absent. He is still the same God who heard them in the past and so they are confident that he hears them now. The occasions of God's silence cause the psalmist to examine themselves and to seek God, but with confession and humble petitions. They know that God will not remain silent forever. The psalms demonstrate that communication with God must go on, regardless of life's circumstances. 
And so to finish the day, what can we learn from the psalmist's responses to God's apparent absence? And how do you respond to times when God does seem silent? What sustains your faith? Wednesday, January 31. Has his promise failed forevermore? Read Psalm 77. What experience is the author going through? Psalm 77, beginning at verse 1. I cried out to God with my voice, to God with my voice, and he gave ear to me. In the day of my trouble I sought the Lord. My hand was stretched out in the night without ceasing. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. Salah. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I meditate within my heart, and my spirit makes diligent search. Will the Lord cast off forever, and will he be favourable no more? Has his mercy ceased forever? Has his promise failed forevermore? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? Salah. And I said, This is my anguish, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will also meditate on all your work and talk of your deeds. Your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? You are the God who does wonders. You have declared your strength among the peoples. You have with your arm redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph, Salah. The waters saw you, O God, the waters saw you. They were afraid, and depths also trembled. The clouds poured out water, the skies sent out a sound. Your arrows also flashed about. The voice of your thunder was in the whirlwind. The lightnings lit up the world, the earth trembled and shook. Your way was in the sea, your paths in the great waters, and your footsteps were not known. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Psalm 77 begins with a plea to God for help that is filled with lament and painful remembering of the past in the first six verses. The psalmist's whole being is mournfully turned to God. He refuses to be comforted by any relief except the one coming from God. However, remembering God appears to intensify his anguish. When I remember God, I moan, in verse 3. Hebrew hammer, moan, often depicts the roar of raging waters, as we read in Psalm 46 and verse 3. Though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, Selah. Similarly, the psalmist's whole being is in a state of intense unrest. How can remembering God produce such strong feelings of distress? A series of troubling questions betray the cause of his anguish in verses 7 to 9 of Psalm 77. Will the Lord cast off forever? And will he be favourable no more? Has his mercy ceased forever? Has his promise failed forevermore? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? Selah. Has God changed? Can God possibly betray his covenant? The stark contrast between God's saving acts in the past and God's apparent absence in the present causes the psalmist to feel abandoned by God. If God has changed, then the psalmist has no hope, a conclusion that he struggles to reject. Meanwhile, the psalmist cannot sleep because the Lord keeps him awake, as he says in verse 4 of Psalm 77. 
This recalls other biblical characters whose insomnia was providentially used by God to advance his purposes. As you read in Genesis 41, verses 1 to 8, Then it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream, and behold, he stood by the river. Suddenly there came up out of the river seven cows, fine-looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then, behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. And the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine-looking and fat cows. So Pharaoh awoke. He slept and dreamed a second time, and suddenly seven heads of grain came up on one stalk, plump and good. Then, behold, seven thin heads, blighted by the east wind, sprang up after them. And the seven thin heads devoured the seven plump and full heads. So Pharaoh awoke, and indeed it was a dream. Now it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh, and then in Esther chapter 6 verse 1 we read, That night the king could not sleep. So one was commanded to bring the book of the records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And Daniel 2 verses 1 to 3. Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. The long, sleepless night causes the psalmist to consider the Lord's past acts of deliverance, but with new resolve. We read in Psalm 77 verse 5, I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient times, and verse 10, And I said, This is my anguish, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. The assurance that the psalmist receives from God does not consist of explanations about his personal situation, but rather a confirmation of God's faithfulness and trustworthiness like Job. The psalmist is encouraged to wait on the Lord in faith, knowing that he is the same God who performed miracles in Israel's past, which he expressed in verses 11 to 18. The psalmist also realises that your footsteps were not known in verse 19. Recognising God's guidance, even in situations in which his presence is not obvious to human eyes. The psalmist acknowledges that God is simultaneously revealed and hidden, and so he offers praise to the Lord's mysterious and sovereign ways. And so to finish today, think about past times when the Lord worked in your life. How can that truth help you deal with whatever you are facing now? Thursday, February 1, Lest the Righteous Be Tempted. Read Psalm 37, verses 1 and 8, Psalm 49, verses 5 to 7, Psalm 94, verses 3 to 7, and Psalm 125, verse 3. What struggle does the psalmist face? First of all, Psalm 37, verse 1, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. And verse 8, Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. Then Psalm 49, verses 5 to 7, Why should I fear in the days of evil, when the iniquity of my heels surrounds me? Those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. And Psalm 94, verses 3 to 7, Lord, how long will the wicked... How long will the wicked triumph? 
They utter speech and speak insolent things. All the workers of iniquity boast in themselves. They break in pieces your people, O Lord, and afflict your heritage. They slay the widow and the stranger and murder the fatherless. Yet they say, The Lord does not see, nor does the God of Jacob understand. And Psalm 125, verse 3. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous reach out their hands to iniquity. These psalms lament the current prosperity of the wicked and the challenge that this fact poses to the righteous. The wicked not only prosper, but at times also openly despise God and oppress others. The perplexing issue is that while the scepter of wickedness in Psalm 125.3 dominates the world, the scepter of righteousness in Psalm 45 verse 6 seems to be failing. Why not then give up and embrace evil as others do? Read Psalm 73 verses 1 to 20 and verse 27. What brings the psalmist through the crisis? What is the end of those who trust in futile things? See also First Peter 1 and verse 17. Psalm 73, beginning at verse 1. Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore his people return here, and waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, How does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places, you cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so, Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. And verse 27, For indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry. And we compare that with First Peter chapter 1, verse 17. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. While the psalmist in Psalm 73 remained focused on the current iniquity in the world, he was unable to see the big picture from God's point of view. The problem that the prosperity of evil posed to his faith was overwhelming. He believed also that his argument about the uselessness of faith was based on reality. However, as Johannes Brugenhagen writes in Reformation Commentary on Scripture, page 11, Psalm 73 shows that these things mock those who ignore the first voice of this psalm, which is the summary of the whole psalm, how good the God of Israel is to those who are upright in heart. End of quote. The psalmist is led to the sanctuary, the place of God's sovereign rule, and was reminded there that today is only one piece of the mosaic, and he should consider the end when the wicked will face God's judgment. 
The fact that the psalmist understood this truth in the sanctuary and confessed his previous folly shows that reality can be grasped only by spiritual insight and not by human logic. And so to finish today, how does the promise of God's judgment upon the world and upon all its evil give you comfort when so much evil now goes unpunished? Friday, February 2, Further Thought Read Psalm 56 and the Ellen G. White Rejoicing in the Lord, pages 115 to 126 in the book Steps to Christ. Well, today we'll read Psalm 56. Be merciful to me, O God, for man would swallow me up, fighting all day he oppresses me. My enemies would hound me all day, for there are many who fight against me, O Most High. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? All day they twist my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather together, they hide, they mark my steps when they lie in wait for my life. Shall they escape by iniquity? In anger, cast down the peoples, O God." You number my wanderings, put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? When I cry out to you, then my enemies will turn back. This I know, because God is for me. In God I will praise his word. In the Lord I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Vows made to you are binding upon me, O God. I will render praises to you. For you have delivered my soul from death. Have you not kept my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? Like the psalmists, God's people of all times wonder every so often how to sing the Lord's song in a strange land. Our faith in the sovereign rule of the Lord is challenged, at times severely, and we may ponder whether God is in control or truly as powerful and good as the Scriptures say. Biblical faith often implies uncertainty and suspense as much as confidence and assertion. Sometimes uncertainty and suspense, especially in the face of evil and God's seeming absence, can be almost unbearable. Yet, Uncertainty must never be about God or his loving and righteous character and trustworthiness. The psalmists may be uncertain about the future, but they often appeal to God's unfailing love and faithfulness. As you read in Psalm 36, verses 5 to 10, Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the great mountains. Your judgments are a great deep. O Lord, you preserve man and beast. How precious is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. They are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your pleasures. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. O oh, continue your loving kindness to those who know you, and your righteousness to the upright in heart. And then Psalm 89 verse 2, For I have said, Mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness you shall establish in the very heavens. And verse 8, O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty like you, O Lord? Your faithfulness also surrounds you. Likewise, we are to follow the same example. As you read in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, pages 578 and 579, summon all your powers to look up, not down at your difficulties. Then you will never faint by the way. You will soon see Jesus behind the cloud, reaching out his hand to help you. And all you have to do is to give him your hand in simple faith and let him lead you. As you become trustful, you will, through faith in Jesus, become hopeful. End of quote. 
The times when God hides his face do not undermine the efficacy of prayer. On the contrary, these occasions cause the psalmist to examine themselves, recall God's past saving acts, and seek God with confession and humble petitions. As you read in Psalm 77, verses 10 to 12, And I said, This is my anguish, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will also meditate on all your work and talk of your deeds. And Psalm 89 verses 46 to 52. How long, Lord, will you hide yourself forever? Will your wrath burn like fire? Remember how short my time is. For what futility have you created all the children of men? What man can live and not see death? Can he deliver his life from the power of the grave? Salah. Lord, where are your former loving kindnesses, which you swore to David in your truth? Remember, Lord, the reproach of your servants, how I bear in my bosom the reproach of all the many peoples with which your enemies have reproached, O Lord, with which they have reproached the footsteps of your anointed. Blessed be the Lord for evermore. Amen and Amen. And then Ellen White writes in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, page 5, 555, faith grows strong by coming in conflict with doubts and opposing influences. The experience gained in these trials is of more value than the most costly jewels. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, what tensions did the psalmist experience in the face of evil? What similar tensions have you faced and how have you dealt with them? How do you maintain your faith during these times? And two, where should we look for answers when our faith in God is tested by trials or by people whose own sufferings cause them to question the goodness and power of God? How do you answer the common question about evil in a world created and sustained by an all-powerful God of love? How does the great controversy motif help answer, at least somewhat, this challenge? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Giving Up on God, Part 1, by Andrew McChesney. Five-year-old Sikuli was frightened by grandmother's warnings about hell. You must be good, grandmother said. If you aren't good, you'll end up in hell. What do you mean end up in hell, the boy asked. You'll end up in eternal flames if you lie or steal, she said. You will feel the flames for all eternity. Grandmother's words ignited great fear in the young boy's heart. He was confused. On the one hand, she said God is love. On the other, she said that if Sakula lied, he would end up in hell. Sakuli was afraid because he couldn't help but lie sometimes. The boy didn't know what to do. He couldn't turn to his parents. They were not Christians in then communist Montenegro. Grandmother was the only Christian whom he knew in his village. One day, when no one was looking, he hid behind a bush and scolded God. I don't know why people say you are love, he said. You aren't love, but a monster. Why did you create me to end up in flames? Am I supposed to be faithful and not lie and do bad things? I can't believe in you and I won't believe in you. You are a monster. Sakuli was finished with God. He was only five and had no interest in God. Nine years later, at the age of 14, Sakuli was sent away to a boarding high school in Sarajevo, capital of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Among the 700 boys at the school, he was the only one from Montenegro. Sensing that he faced, up at, faced an uphill battle as an outsider, he resorted to fighting to gain acceptance with his classmates. He fought nearly every day. If someone even touched one of his ears and they were a temptation to touch because they stuck out like a teacup handle, he acted viciously. 
One fight left him with a knife scar on a hand. Sekuli also was a bully. When a younger boy received a food package from home, Sekuli dangled him outside a dorm window by the ankles until he handed over the package. After three years of fighting, a desire grew in Sekuli to know truth. He wondered whether Grandmother had told him the truth about God. But what was truth? Sarajevo had several main religions, Islam, Orthodoxy, Catholicism and Judaism. Sekuli wondered, if God is one, why are there so many religions? He decided to become familiar with all religions to find the truth. Sekuli Sekuli is an affluent entrepreneur and faithful Seventh-day Adventist in Montenegro. Read more of his story next week. Thank you for your Sabbath School mission offerings that help spread the good news of Jesus soon coming to Montenegro and around the world.